So Martin, I'm not one for big milestones and numbers and things like that, but this is episode 151. That's true. It's the first generation of Pokemon. Yeah. And as, you're going for. as a Gen 1 guy, it's pretty special to me. As a casual, I as, think is what you meant. As a filthy yes, casual. it is pretty special. I just can't get Nintendo off the brain today. And yeah. I know you can't. Well, obviously. I th- I would estimate that your potential work effectiveness is about 10% today. Because 90% of your brain, since I have heard you... I don't think I saw you this morning, but since I got back from the coffee shop, it's been it's just been occupied by Switch related things. As it should be. But I can't blame you. Launching. That's on, true. On this, the day of my daughter's wedding. <laughs> you come to me. On you this, come to me on this the, the day, day of the Switch, the Switch launch, release. And you ask me for a favor. <laughs> you ask me to do work and to think and to use my brain. Excuse me? I am pretty stoked though. This will be the first midnight release that I have ever gone to to buy something that I pre-ordered. Ever. Ever? Ever. Really? And not in terms of games. I mean, in terms of anything. I never waited in line for iPhones. I never waited in line for like, huh. I don't know. What do people wait in line for? Like sheepskin handbags? Is that Do people wait in line for that? They, they might. Like I don't the, know. No, they probably send their the like. shepherd's house? They probably send like some somebody they pay to buy things for them to wait in line for that. Yeah. I want to become so rich that I become one of those people who needs to hire a purchaser to fill my house with crap. That does seem because like I don't have enough time to rich. do that. Like, like, are you tasteful? Do you have nothing better to do with your life than to spend someone else's money on things for them? Come be my purchaser. Uh huh. Uh huh. I can't say that I ever <laughs> want that. I don't. I don't want that. They're gonna buy things, and I'm gonna be like, "Why'd you get things?" Yeah, I don't remember where it was, so this won't be in the show notes. But I, I remember reading an article about. Somebody who got so rich uh, so fast, and I think it was because they did something in tech, maybe something to do with some programming language they helped build or something. Uh, and they like let it take over their lives to the point where they actually they moved to Seattle and they had a purchaser. And I, I think like crazy. the dude was writing the article after he had like basically renounced that whole life and decided like this is stupid. I think he even went to live in like a tiny house or something after that. Uh huh. A little beats and pieces of the story have come, up, come back to me. I feel like he, he moved into a tiny house and started like an eco-friendly blog or something. But before that, he was ultra rich and had a purchasing agent and whatever for his life. Yeah. Isn't that just your number one aspiration, um, though? No. Have a purchasing. I don't I'll, even want to own things. Why would I want someone else to buy things I didn't even choose? Talk to my guy, you know. I, I know I want to buy some art, but I'm not sure how much art. Just talk to my guy. He, he'll get He'll get some stuff, probably. I'll probably like it. Yeah. And if I don't like it, I'll feed him to alligators. Just like the last one. Uh-huh. <laughs> All right, I need to open my tea real quick. Open your... If you could even oh, call this canned, tea. It's a canned tea thing. What is it's this? It's Stee's lightly sweetened iced green tea, but what it tastes like is yummy juice. Yummy juice. Yummy juice. <laughs> that's, that's gross for some reason. Yummy juice co. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it, no, it's good. I don't know. They probably just put like a lot of sugar in it. I don't even know if I want to look at the back of the can. Yeah. No, it's not that bad. They just make it taste good, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, we've got questions. We do um, have questions. We're going to get into these questions. We've got three good questions from people, probably from the Reddit, possibly from Twitter. I don't know where these questions came from. They or came possibly from, from email. The they came from the ether. Pulled um, them right out of there. They were filtered up from a different dimension. Oh my god! I didn't, did I tell you about this? I where is this leading? So pe- people have been telling me to listen to Joe Rogan's podcast for a long time, uh, and I didn't know who Joe Rogan even was. And then I looked him up, and it's like, oh, he's this UFC fight commentator guy, and he apparently has like the biggest podcast in the world. And as a podcaster, I feel a little weird that I didn't know about it. So I started listening to I listened to what uh, his his episode with Neil deGrasse Tyson, and then. This is what I think I did tell you. He had Alex Jones from InfoWars on the show. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I, I'm now secretly, or not secretly, I'm now convinced that Alex Jones is secretly a comedian because that was like the funniest three hours of just nonsense I've ever listened to. Are you sure it wasn't the truth? It may have been the truth. There may be information and transmissions filtering up through different dimensional gateways and sun, star, platinum things 
filtering to our brains. Yeah. And we may be some sort of super organism that only lives for one millisecond, but we perceive it as years. That may be the truth. It may be the truth. But it also may be great comedy gold. It's a truth conspiracy. It could be, yes. But if it is the truth, these questions could very possibly have come from a weird third, 15th dimensional Stargate. They probably came from Twitter, though. Okay. On that note, questions can also now come from our YouTube channel because we have a oh, YouTube yeah. channel for the College of Boogie podcast. Possibly you're listening to this very episode on that channel in the future. But uh, as we're recording this, we are not yet current on the channel. I'm publishing episodes starting from episode 100 to the current episode every single day until we get current. And the one that went live today was um, the one on how to learn how to code, which that was a good episode. Oh, yeah. You are very, very helpful in that episode because you definitely know how to code better than me. I try. And I, I want to do a video on that at some point. But man, that's a tough question. Like, how do I learn how to code? It's a big question. It's, it's a very big question with a lot of different answers. So I'm, I'm currently debating how am I going to answer that question uh, in a sufficiently short but also useful way. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it'll be here's my general philosophy on coding. Now, here's a giant list of every resource you could possibly think of oh, see, for every but, language see, but every know. resource that could be overwhelming that's true that could be overwhelming watch out maybe i'll just be like start with basic i it don't care what you want to do with one thing yeah i don't know why doesn't even matter how hard i try I yeah can't this even is make... not involved in the lincoln park lyrics i'm sorry <laughs> this is my bad anyway all I have to say we've got the youtube channel now um looks like 2000 and oh this is out of date 2,800 and dun, 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 25 people have subscribed to the channel so far, and you could be the 2,826th or some other number that's bigger than that if you want. Yeah, that's true. If you want to be a bigger number, just yeah, wait. Well, I didn't. So I thought the YouTube channel would be just kind of like an extra little fun thing. Maybe some people would like prefer to listen to it, um, but I'm getting emails from people saying like, oh, this is awesome because I literally don't have access to Google Play for some reason. Like, I guess they're in a country where it's blocked or something like that. Oh, really? Yeah. Or they have no space for a podcast up on their phone. So I'm oh, pretty that, pumped. That makes sense. People do use up the space on their phone. That's true. Yeah. I've been living with this 128 gigabyte iPhone for long enough now that I've forgotten what it's like to have to delete an app every time you want to do something on your phone. But that was my life for a very long time. Well, to be fair, the problem is that you wanted to do something on your phone. Just delete all the apps and then it's fine. I fine. could do that. You never run into space problems. That's true. I think you and Cal Newport would be friends. Delete all social media, delete all the apps. Just, you yeah. know, just chill. We be would be friends, but we can't find each other on social media because we're not currently <laughs> using it. You can never be friends because you don't, yeah. you're not next door neighbors. <laughs> yeah. That's the prerequisite. All right, let's get to these questions. Uh, first question this week is, I'm a freshman in college and I've already joined an international organization where I'm learning a lot about marketing, management, business, human resources, but with the end of the first semester here now, I feel like I'm not getting the grades that I could have gotten if I was 100% dedicated to my academic learning. So what's more important to companies and employers, good grades or a good curriculum filled with extracurricular activities? You're doing fine, dude. That's or, or you know, maybe not a dude. I don't know. I don't know who asked, who asked this yeah, question. Sure. We have no idea who asked it. But th what you're doing is the right thing. Um, and we've had episodes about this uh specifically episode 84 with my friend tom miller from wtf professor we had a whole discussion about like perfect grades and, and good grades and good gpa versus a well-rounded education where you're getting a lot of experience in addition to your classwork uh, but just to give you like the broad overview here there's something called the signaling model of education in economics which basically says that like a degree is a signal that employers, companies, hiring managers, recruiters, they use as sort of like a filtering device where like a degree basically says to somebody who is overviewing a lot of different candidates, all right, these people have this piece of paper, this label on them that says they have at least, at least been able to get through four years of education, four years of difficult academic work, persevere through all that, and what that means is that they are probably qualified to learn all they need to learn for working for me and to be able to do what I need them to do. So it's like a shortcut. 
you know, a mental heuristic. But the thing is, perfect grades are not nearly as, as strong of a signal as just the, the degree itself. So this is why we say like, you put your GPA on your resume if it's like a 3.2 or higher, but if it's on there for like the vast majority of organizations and industries out there, they're going to be looking for other things beyond the grades. As long as like, as long as they can look at your degree and be like, all right, this person didn't scrape by, by the skin of their teeth. As long as they did decently well, they're going to pass that. That's like, okay, that's the foot in the door. Now I want to see what else have you done? What have you done that differentiates you from everyone else who went to college? Cause that's kind of the thing, right? Like, go to college is the basic, I don't know, like ground level thing you're supposed to do to get a good job. At least that's what it feels like in this country. Yeah. Yeah. Other than like the jobs that you can get without that don't seem to be advertised nearly as much. Well, I think they don't, they're not advertised nearly as much because, and this is a whole other thing. I'm getting the feeling that as time goes on, like more and more a college education is becoming a product to be marketed and sold rather than like this yeah. tough gauntlet you're supposed to run that's supposed to challenge you and force you to grow. I mean, don't get me wrong. It will do that. And I don't want to like disrespect any of the teachers out there who put a lot of effort into helping their students grow and challenge them. But from like a high level standpoint, I mean, all these colleges are they're competing for good students. They are advertising their placement rates. They're advertising all these things. And they're trying to get people to come in and pay for their product, which is the education. You know, there's like it's not 100 percent focused on the development of the student. That's yeah. all I'm saying. That there are other incentives there. So like you have to be looking out for your best interests because the college won't always do that because they have their own. They have their own interests that may run counter to what is absolutely best for you. Yeah. Not no. every college, but just it's a thing, you know, there might be some cases where you need a higher GPA, right? What if you're trying to be a doctor or something? What if I don't know these careers specifically that might require things? What about uh, graduate school? Would yeah. they maybe have a higher requirement you'd know about beforehand? So those are interesting cases on a on like a total overview level general statement. Yes, you do need better grades to have a better shot at getting into grad school, medical school. Um some old older or like more competitive industries like maybe you know east coast investment banking or law stuff like that they're going to be looking for like people who basically just tick all the boxes in a bunch of areas including grades but i know people who buck the trend and who have gotten into say medical school without perfect grades a great example of that is my friend ryan newen who back in episode 26 told me that he didn't get a perfect GPA, and yet he still got, I think he applied to like like 11 medical schools and got offers for like eight of them or something like that. Nice. And maybe my numbers are off, but I know he got a lot of offers. Like the majority of the things he applied to, he got offers for. And the reason for that was that he had done work with uh, Doctors Without, I think it was Doctors Without Walls, because there's Doctors Without Borders, but there's Doctors Without Walls. That's another organization where you go out into like inner city areas and you provide medical care, things like that. He'd done all these extracurricular things. He'd started a blog for medical students, done a lot of like marketing stuff like that. And that was all that experience was able to let him impress the people on the medical school admittance boards. So they were basically, they were basically able to say, okay, this guy, he's got like a 3.6 or 3.5. All these other people have 4.0s, perfect grades, you know, what is it, summa cum laude or whatever? No idea. This guy's not, but he did all this stuff. We're going to let him in. So there are even cases where you can look at medical school, graduate school, or all of these industries that really pride perfect grades. And you can see examples of people who have still gotten in because the value of their extracurricular work really spoke for itself. Cool. So so grades themselves are not the golden key no. to get into everything. No, absolutely not. You know, so... um. I'll tell you my own story. I was a 4.0 student in high school and I got to college and I thought, okay, I'm going to keep that up. I'm going to stay with the 4.0 thing. And I don't even think I, I got like a 4.0 even my freshman year, but 
there came a point during my junior year, pretty early on, where I had this realization that I really either want to be an entrepreneur or I want to work for a small company, maybe a startup, or maybe, you know, maybe a small business that doesn't have the startup mentality, but it's still, it's like a small team of people. And what I had learned through both talking with small business owners, talking with entrepreneurs, doing all this stuff in the entrepreneurial community was that for the most part with small businesses and startups, they do not care about your grades. They care about what can you show me that's tangible that will let me know that you can do the work that we need done because maybe we don't have the clearly defined roles and procedures and training classes that we can get you up to speed on. We need somebody who's a go-getter who can come in, who can learn on the fly, who can solve problems and grades don't necessarily communicate that ability. So after my internship ended, the summer after my sophomore year, junior year starts and I decide um, very deliberately that I'm going to stop caring about getting perfect grades. Now, it doesn't mean I was like skipping all my classes and not trying at all, but I wasn't spending hours studying anymore and I was okay with getting like a B in my classes. Some classes I still got an A in because they were easy enough. Some classes I got a B in, one class I got a C in, but that was fine because I was diverting all the time I would have spent studying over to writing more articles on College Info Geek, on redesigning the site, teaching myself all the code I needed for that, doing jobs on campus, all this stuff that I feel was a lot more important to the development of where I am now. Yeah, it was a trade-off that made sense. Yeah, which I don't actually know. Did you have anything like that with uh, your final years in college? With my final years in college? I would say the entirety of college for me, honestly. I My goal was to get a 3.5. Okay. And I think in the last year, I decided that a 3.2 something would be fine just mm. because I was working through trying to get that internship. I got the job that I wanted. And so I was working my last semester. Yeah. And that was far more important to my next job after college. Hint, it was literally that one mm -hmm. than <laughs> like some extra grade points. Yeah, exactly. Another thing on that note, um, not grades, but I was in the honors program for three years of college. And at Iowa State, the honors program is something you have to apply for before your freshman year starts. And then you get into a freshman honors program, which includes a class you go to. I think once a week and some other things you do, which was really helpful. And then if you graduate with honors, you get to basically wear this fancy cord with your graduation robes and you get to put on your resume honors graduate. Ooh, but there were some requirements to finishing that honors program. You had to take these, uh, what are they called? Like honors seminars, which were oh, yeah. once per week classes some of them were interesting, like one of the classes you could get into was like the lore of Harry Potter, which is kind of interesting, but it was an extra class. And then the final like senior year, you would have to do a capstone project where you'd have to basically like pitch some sort of cool research project or some other kind of project you would do. You'd have to either like write a paper or do a presentation. And it was supposed to be something pretty substantial. So I got to my senior year and I'm like trying to figure out what I'm going to do with or for my capstone project and i'm trying to figure out like how can i divert some time that i would rather be using on college info geek or on getting my classwork done and i kind of came to this realization that if the startup world or entrepreneurship or small business is where the where i want to go does it really matter if i have honors graduate on my resume like is anyone going to actually care about that other than me yeah. And when I ask myself, honestly, like the answer is no. And I can tell you, like, I have not had a use for my resume since I graduated. Yeah. You know, I, I've you never had your own grade point average. And you're like, <laughs> not good enough, Tom. You're fired. Oh, yeah. You know, some some days I'm just like, am I really allowed to be a YouTuber? Because I only had a 3.46 GPA. Hmm. I should probably fire myself, actually. Yeah, you probably no, should. No, I don't. It doesn't matter. So... I guess to, to wrap this up in a bow, number one, you absolutely need to be rounding out your education with more practical hands-on experience of some sort. It could be an internship, it could be a part-time job that uses your major area skills or that builds your communication skills or your leadership skills. It could be a personal project that has some tangible, impressive results that you can show or that you can build a case study off of and present. 
It could be an organization you join on campus where you actually, not just an organization where you just like join and show up, like something where you have a role and you can do something and you can show off what you've learned and what you've accomplished through it. So like, say you, you join, like I joined business council, uh, business council was cool, but being on the leadership board of business council and being their web developer, that was what I believe was the most impressive part of that entire experience. Yeah. So you absolutely need to be rounding out your, um, your whole resume and your whole experience with things like that. And when it comes to the perfectness of your grades, number one, I think that in like 99% of cases, perfect grades are never needed. Um, but when it comes to just like how good they are, like maybe like 3.95 versus 3.5 or something like that, you have to gauge what your goals are, what your industry is, and then go from there. So yeah. if you're a med student, you are, or you're trying to get into Harvard Law, or you're going to go be an eye banker or something in like an industry that really prides perfection and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you're going to have to probably put a little bit more stock in your performance on that metric. Um, but if you want to go into something that's a little different, it might not matter so much. And maybe your time would be better used on something that is going to matter to whoever you're trying to impress later on. All right, so let's get into this next question. Uh, and so I'm interested in your answer on this one first, because I know you you like to mess around with systems all the time I when do. it comes to task management, note taking, stuff like that. So the question is, I know that both analog and digital mediums of task management and note taking have their pros and cons. Writing on physical notebooks tends to aid memory and comprehension and it presents less distractions, but digital systems have synchronization, backups, searching, and reminders. So how can you integrate these two systems into a single system which could harness the advantages and mitigate the disadvantages? Okay, so um, first off, the reason I originally bought an iPod Touch a billion years ago was mm -hmm. for Evernote. Which, fun fact, you can scan stuff into it, and it can read handwriting, and it can make your notes searchable. Mm -hmm. So if you really want to combine stuff, you can, even now, I mean, camera phones are strong enough, you can just take a picture of the notes you just took, yeah, and it's probably going to be readable and searchable. And probably not just Evernote. I mean, does OneNote do that? I'm not sure. Uh, I think OneNote does do the OCR. But you, yeah, you can, put, you, can put tags, you can read notes and stuff. Right. There are several apps that do it. Yeah, right now, though, I am not using a lot of digital stuff. I'm mostly using my Moleskine notebook. Mm -hmm. And that's just because it helps me focus a lot better like this like this reader was saying, but also because if there's something on there that I don't remember in 5 days, usually it's just because it wasn't important enough to remember in 5 days. So for me, it's not a big deal anymore. Okay. But in class, I would usually I would take notes and then I would put it in Evernote somehow. Yeah, I've always kind of flip flops back and forth between Evernote and paper notes. And you know, the thing is, I was never personally big on digitizing my notes. Yeah, like, I guess I just never felt a huge need for it. But also, I never really hardcore studied. I mean, I guess I, I did study my notes, but I feel like I didn't study them in the way that a lot of students do, like, to the degree of intensity. Yeah. And that's the thing about my particular college experience, what I, what I try to do with my videos is I try to present like the best possible techniques to use for retaining information or for whatever your academic goals may be. But they're not necessarily the things that I always did myself because my goals weren't always that. Like my goals maybe weren't always get a perfect grade in this test. Or maybe I just didn't put enough, um, you know, enough stock in that to, to put in the effort necessary. And that's fine because again, like I had goals that maybe superseded those goals. So I spent more time on those things. But in terms of this question, I think for like for task management, the digital systems with all their cool bells and whistles and reminders and stuff like that, those are useful for more like overview planning, like high level, like a, a big task management system that basically runs your life. Um, and then I find paper or whiteboards or some sort of physical system to yeah. work better for me on a day to day in the trenches basis. So for me, this is why I use a three step task management system where I have a digital system, which is um, Asana as like my everything. That's where if I need to quick capture something, anything comes up, uh, email inbox tasks, it all goes to Asana because I can have due dates. I can assign things to other people if I need to. I can make reminders all those cool things. 
But then at the beginning of every week, I look at Asana, I look at my due dates, I look at my goals, and I create a one sheet overview of the week on notebook paper. So that's what I work from throughout the week. So when I wake up in the morning and I do my morning routine and I get to the planning portion of my day, I'm like, all right, I'm going to go look at that paper, not at Asana. Yeah. You know, and maybe if I like happen to know, okay, something else came into Asana yesterday, it's now Wednesday, maybe I need to add that to my paper. So I'll kind of know that I, that I entered something earlier, but for the most part, I'm looking at that piece of paper and then I will usually, and this is, this sounds so dumb, but I like doing it when I want to create a day, like a daily list of things to do. I do it on that whiteboard. And then if I'm going to go somewhere else to work, I take a picture of my whiteboard task list (laughs) and I look at the picture on my phone for what to do. That's funny. I've actually considered doing that too, but I felt <laughs> I felt like it felt dumb, but I like the whiteboard so much better than Yeah. It is dumb. Like it it's it's stupid. Writing it out just feels better. Yeah. I don't know I don't know what it is and I don't know what it is about the whiteboard versus the paper. I just like writing out things mm-hmm. on a whiteboard I and I like writing checking it a, a box on the whiteboard. If you like wrote stuff out on an iPad Pro or something, I wonder if it have the same effect cuz it cuz that's a little bit more physical. It but, might. I don't know. I but really like paper and whiteboards personally. I, I am unwilling to purchase an iPad Pro for that yeah, I'm reason. Not, I'm not going to get it for because that. Because what is it, like $800 or $1,000 or something? Yeah, and a whiteboard's like nothing. I have it's an iPad mini, and I read books on the iPad mini, and I occasionally play games on it. Yeah. But that's about it. Um, I'm not I'm not a big iPad work guy. I know that like some people like, Excuse me, like CGP Gray and Mike Hurley are huge on working on iPads, but no, for my for my purposes, a computer is where work is done, and I don't know. I guess I just like using the whiteboard for those tasks. Yeah, so well, I'll just continue a, to. <laughs> it's a pretty good compromise if you if you have the technical system as sort of a database of all your tasks because yeah. it's better at holding things long term. But if you prefer using paper or a whiteboard and pulling off little chunks, that's a lot less overwhelming if you wake up and you look at a list of 10 things instead of like the list of the next several months worth of work. Yeah. It's going to like scare you. Absolutely. It's all about Um, avoiding overwhelm. It's also about not chasing rabbit holes that don't matter. Yeah. I'm prone to see something that's in a sauna and it's maybe less important or less urgent than what's currently planned for the week. But I'm like, ooh, that looks less boring than what I've already planned. Maybe I'll just do yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good thing to keep yourself away from. Mm-hmm. And also, if you want to use digital stuff and you really want to type, you don't want to handwrite, but you want to be less distracted. One thing that I remember that I did in college was that I brought a wireless keyboard and then typed on my phone because a phone is like a one app on the screen at a time thing usually. Yeah. Which means that you're in the note taking app, not on the internet. So it didn't yeah. distract me as much. You could do that. Also, um, I use Cold Tricky Writer to write scripts, but Ooh, you probably if you want to type your notes, you could bring your laptop to class and then you could just, uh, it has a time function rather than a word count function. So instead of saying like, I want to write a thousand words, you could say, I want to write for the duration of this class period. So if it's 50 minutes, just put 50 minutes in there. And that basically turns your computer oh, into yeah. a typewriter. You can do nothing but write those notes. That's cool. So that's the thing. The other thing I want to mention, um, I said I wasn't big on digitization of notes, but that doesn't mean it's a bad uh, option. And if you really do want to get the best of both worlds, you want to get all those searchability and everything of the digital tools, but you want to write your notes out by hand. Um, You were saying like Evernote has that optical character recognition. And the app that I use on my iPhone is called Scannable. And Scannable is my absolute favorite scanning app because you don't even have to push a button to take the picture. You just open the app, you hold it over the piece of paper, it kind of detects the edges, and then it will take a snapshot. It'll just do it by itself. Just by itself. And so say you have like 10 pages of notes from one class session. You take one, it kind of like takes a snapshot. It also doctors the photo a little bit. So it's not like a, it's not an actual photo of the page that you get you don't see the paper texture or anything you'll actually like do some crazy contrast stuff so basically you just get a white background with black text Hmm. um and i haven't tested it with anything color so if you're one of those people who likes to highlight and color your notes and draw mario levels in the margins like maybe test it out and see what happens but it does heavily up the contrast to make the text even more searchable and then 
it'll like create a little doc of all the pages that you're that you're taking for that session. So if you have 10 pages, you can easily digitize 10 pages really quickly and then hit save and it will stitch them all together into one PDF and send that into one Evernote note. Cool. And you can easily choose the notebook. So the one thing I always did with Evernote is I would have a notebook stack called present classes and all of that current semester's classes were in there. And then I had another notebook stack called previous classes. So all the previous semesters, they got moved into there, you know, once that semester was over. So with Scannable, you can easily just say, which notebook do I want? Okay, this is English 310. Boom. Click that. Hit save. Automatically gets sent to Evernote. And you can choose the title as well. So you wouldn't even have to open Evernote to digitize those notes really quickly. Cool. Get a nicely stitched together PDF. You're good to go. And then you get all those benefits without the distraction and with the tactile goodness of writing on paper. Yeah. Can't be beat. Can't be beat. All right. Last question before we wrap this guy up. Uh, that is, how should we best choose a career or major for ourselves? And what point should we keep in mind when doing so? Should we focus on the material gains or our interests and in happiness? What is happiness, Martin? Um, I think a, happiness is material question. things. Yeah. Happy, I just want to get as much happiness stuff as is possible. Money. Yeah. He who yeah. dies with the most toys wins. That's all I'm saying. Now, um, so I asked Cal Newport about this back in episode 35. Well, I think, I think the question I asked him was, how do you choose your major? And his answer was pretty simple. He just said, pick something that interests you and then work as hard as you can for a long period of time to get good at it. Because as you work at something, you gain competence in it. And that competence will often breed interest and sometimes even passion. Or all that work will illuminate the fact that you don't like what you're doing. But I, I firmly believe that a lot of like most people can't know what they like and don't like without a huge investment of effort and without actually getting their hands dirty. Yeah. Well, and I think figuring it out. we tend to like things more when we become good at them. And then we're like, hey, that yeah. gives me a boost of confidence. Now that feels like a part of me because I'm so good at it. Mm -hmm. But the other thing you can do is you can ask yourself, like, what do you spend your time doing? And this question isn't going to be helpful to everyone because I know a lot of people like they you ask them this question they're like, well, I spend my time playing video games. And, you know, I, you could you could like be tempted to fall along the uh, the path of like, oh, well, you should just be a video game designer. But I I really don't believe that people who spend that at least not everyone uh, who spends their time consuming video game content is cut out for developing video game content. Yeah. Just because you like video games doesn't mean that you're a game maker. Just like the like just because you like watching TV or watching movies doesn't mean that you're the kind of person who wants to craft a story or who would care about all the film angles and filmmaking craft and all that kind of stuff or editing. But if say let's hear here's here's a positive example. Say you really like Mario Maker and you spend hours and hours crafting levels. Maybe that is an indication that you would be good at game design and that would be interesting for you. Yeah, because that's an aspect of game design where you're actually putting some creativity into it. That's a good use for that game. Determine whether you like game design. Yeah, hmm. you know, and there might be something else out there. If you like Mario Maker. Oh, there's like and, RPG Maker, uh, yeah. I guess. And I'm not I don't want to say that, like, if you like to make levels of Mario Maker, you're destined to be a game designer. No, because maybe the fact that you like to craft levels in Mario Maker is indicative of a greater um, interest in like creating things. And maybe you can just use that as sort of like an acid test for different careers that are outside of gaming. Like if you're looking at a career thinking like, all right, is this career going to challenge me to solve problems in creative ways? Or is it going to be more like maintaining systems that somebody else has already set up? Or is it going to be working with people and using a lot of empathy, that kind of thing? Yeah. So identify the things and the qualities. Uh, and they can be hard to identify sometimes in what you already do. And use them as sort of like, I don't know, one of those like weird delving rods that points you in directions. Like a dowsing rod? Yeah. All I'm saying is like there's there's a poltergeist that's kind of there's a poltergeist. pushing you in a certain direction. And just listen to the poltergeist. Yeah. <laughs> just listen. He knows what's up. Oh, also, if you're, if you're so inclined to choose a career and or major or something that doesn't have that awesome of a job field, you should do so knowing that you're going to have to work 
much harder to make it happen. Absolutely. So yeah. th otherwise, later on, you're going to be like, oh, wait, I can't find a job it, because you picked a hard one. So you should expect this. It's going to be it'll be fine maybe if you work harder, but don't go into something that's hard mode without accepting that you're going to have to work harder for it. Yeah, you have to be absolutely aware that there is a sliding scale of the effort that you're going to have to invest. And um, that is determined by like the current economic demand for your area. Yeah. So that's why like people who go into IT a lot of times find it easy to find a job yeah, because like billions of there's a lot of demand hounding down my so, LinkedIn inbox all the time. Exactly. It doesn't mean they don't have to work hard, but you know, there's a clearer path. Maybe they have to put a little less creativity into creating a solution or something they can present. You know, whereas if you go into a major where there's less demand, like philosophy or something, doesn't mean that you can't do anything with it, but you're probably going to have to combine that with something else or work a lot harder to uncover a market or a company that needs the skills that you're going to learn in that kind of a major. Yeah. So just be aware of it. Like you are choosing to play life on hard mode the further you get away from a field where there is demand. Yeah. And if you want to do that, that's fine. Just know that you're doing it. So pick something you like if it's hard mode. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we've said this before. If you pick something that is hard mode like that, try to combine it with something extracurricular that has more demand or that at least is versatile, uh, which is why I've always said like I I would have majored in acting or speech communication oh, yeah. because I was always tinkering around with computers and doing business stuff in my free time, you know, so that would have been a great fallback or something that would be great to combine with all the communication skills and storytelling skills and everything I would have learned in acting. And who knows, I could have potentially became an actor instead. Now, I don't know if I would ever want to be an actor, but it's just an example of like your extracurricular pursuits could help to prop up something that is like a less yeah. safe major choice. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully that is helpful. And uh, unless you have anything else to say on this the nope, day of the Switch, the Switch release, <laughs> we're going to wrap this guy up. Uh, show notes over at CIGpodcast.com slash 151. And Martin, if you don't slip a Mew reference into the show notes, I'm going to be disappointed. Okay. Somehow. I'll, Somehow. I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can put questions for future episodes down in the comments section. Otherwise, you can always go to our subreddit over at collegeinfogeek.com slash community, or you can tweet me at Tom Frankly. We'd love to answer your questions on the show, so let me know what's on your mind. Lastly, if you want to find our favorite resources for becoming more productive, managing your time, saving money, getting hired, all of our favorite tools, they're all over at collegeinfogeek.com slash resources. So check those out and uh, hopefully you have an awesome week. Otherwise, stay cute. See you in the next episode.